Good evening, everyone. Um, you want to be in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 is where we will be beginning tonight. A little bit of an outline is coming around. It's not a real detailed outline. It is mainly uh, something that will allow you to have some room to take notes and such if you, if you so desire. All right. Defenders of the faith is what we've been uh, talking about this week and uh, I want to thank Miller and uh, also Neil for their lessons so far. Uh, those are very, very good. Uh, I won't be able to live up to that, I don't think, but uh, appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, we're going to start off here in Acts chapter 6. And uh, the subject tonight is going to be uh, Stephen. And in chapter 7, uh, there is a recorded speech. Now, sometimes that speech is overlooked. Uh, because it's kind of in scripture kind of coming on the heels of Peter's uh, obviously famous uh, sermon in uh, Acts chapter 2 and in that section of scripture. Well now we're over to Acts chapter 6 and we're going to look at Stephen and then we're going to thank you. Then we're going to look at uh, a speech that he gives uh, as he tries to not really defend himself but he's going to be defending Christianity, thank you. And uh, so we'll, let's take a look. Let's just jump right into Acts chapter 6. Verse 1 says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, so this gives us a glimpse into what was going on uh, in the early church. Now, keep in mind the church at this point here in Acts chapter 6 is still very much in its infancy. It's probably only been around maybe a couple of years at this point, and it is experiencing very rapid growth and has been experiencing very rapid growth. If you'll kind of mark your place there and go back a couple of chapters to Acts chapter 2, uh, we'll, we'll see what's going on there uh, here in the early church. Uh, in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, it says... Uh, then those who gladly received this word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then if you go on over to Acts chapter 4, uh, down in verse 4, uh, it says, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Well, by the time we get over to uh, Acts chapter 6, the word that's used there, it says, uh, in those days when the number of the disciples was not adding, it was multiplying. Okay? There is a difference. Uh, it's one thing to add. It gives you a description of the kind of massive growth that was taking place. They weren't adding at this point. They were multiplying. You know, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, and so on. It was multiplying growing at a very rapid rate. So that's what we see is going on in the church. It's a great thing, right? We all desire that, don't we? We all want to see Lehman Avenue and the church as a whole grow because we know that if the church is growing, what's happening? Souls are being saved, right? People are coming uh, to Christ. But sometimes with growth, uh, there comes what you might call growing pains, uh, there are things that happen that, uh, you know, the new challenges are presented. And that's what happened here. We see there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now, let me also say, uh, if you, there's something you want to say, please speak right up. We'll try to be as informal as possible. Uh, like Miller said last night, I want to be more of a discussion facilitator. So uh, please, uh, please chime in because I think we're going to be here. Well, we've got 45 minutes, so you better be speaking up, okay? So, but anyway, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews. We'll get a little background information as we're introduced to Stephen. Against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Who were the Hellenists? 
Greeks, okay? Jews that were maybe reared or raised uh, or maybe from a foreign land that had come to uh, Jerusalem here. But, and their, you know, whatever was going on, uh, their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the church was taking care of the widows, but the Hellenists uh, had a complaint that though their widows were not being appropriately cared for in their view. And, uh, of course, obviously they may have had some language barriers. There may have been all kinds of reasons, but they were being neglected. So there's the problem. There is a problem that needed to be taken care of. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Okay, so the twelve, who's the twelve? The apostles, right? Twelve are the apostles. Uh, they are essentially doing the work of elders at that time, right? And so uh, they, this problem had gotten their attention. And what you're going to see here in these first few verses, you know, there's all kinds of books available about leadership and, uh, you know, what makes a good leader, uh, books written, seminars given, uh, you know, you, you may, in the workplace, uh, maybe your company will send you to a seminar periodically about how to be a great leader. Uh, maybe you're assigned a book to read about leadership. Uh, I know I have been on several occasions. But if you want to see great leadership in action, you're going to see that here in the first few verses of uh, Acts chapter 6 and how these apostles handle uh, this situation. Number one... The, they recognized that a problem exist, existed. But they also were not going to leave what their responsibility was and what they felt like was most important. Although that was important, they had a job to do and they were not going to be distracted by uh, this issue that had come up. And they, But they were going to solve the problem. Uh, he says... Uh, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And, they, and so they recognize the problem. It says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you men of good reputation. Here's the qualification. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Good reputation. Okay, We know what that means. Uh, people of good reputation, uh, men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. What's it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit? Is it exhibiting those characteristics that we see or the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians chapter 5? And wisdom. How would you define wisdom? Is wisdom knowledge? Yeah, okay, exactly. Wisdom is not knowledge. It's how you use knowledge, right? And uh, the proper application of knowledge. Uh, you know, we see some people who they might know a lot, but not necessarily know how to apply it, right? Uh, sometimes we call it common sense. And so he said, once people of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, that we may appoint over this business. So what are they doing? They recognize the problem, and they're going to do something about it. Did they wait to do something about it? Did they let the problem linger and fester? No. They went right to work. And what did they do? They're going to delegate. That is critical in leadership. You need to put the right people in the right places doing the right things, right? And so that's what they're doing. And they, they set out the qualifications. Now, they said, you seek out from among you seven men who uh, you want... Now, he didn't tell them. We're not told how they were to do that, but they did it. It says, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they communicated this, and it says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And then here's who they chose. And here we are introduced 
to Stephen. He was a man full of faith uh, and the Holy Spirit. And then it lists six other men uh, along with him. There's an interesting thing here. Uh, all seven of these uh, are, are Greek names. So apparently uh, they chose men who would uh, sympathize with what was going on with the Hellenists that were having the issue. In verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples, look what happened again, multiply greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So they recognized the problem. They immediately, without letting it fester and grow, because if, if problems aren't dealt with, what usually happens? It gets worse, right? All right? It gets worse than if you just take care of the situation right then. So they recognized the problem as soon as they were aware of it. They instituted a plan to do something about it. What else did they do? They delegated. Absolutely. You can't spread yourself too thin, right? If you get to doing too much, you won't be do, doing very well anything, right? What else did they do? Prayed. They prayed. Absolutely. They bathed their decisions in prayer, right? Uh, what else? What's that? Laid their hands on them. They also communicated, right? They involved people. They, they communicated uh, with the congregation. Yes, sir. Right, exactly. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah. Sometimes uh, we don't like to be questioned, right? And uh, no, that, that is a very good point. They recognized the problem uh, when, when it was brought to their attention, for sure. Recognized the problem, instituted a plan, they communicated it, and, uh, uh, and then they prayed, which is a absolutely a very important aspect. But what did the... Uh, what did the congregation, what did the disciples do? How did they receive this? Very well, Very well right? They got, right they got right to work. Yeah, they, they, uh, they heard the plan and they were instrumental in uh, instituting the plan. Okay, they got right to work. And uh, they were good followers of this leadership, right? And we can learn from that as well. Uh, and uh, says, and as a result, what was the result of this great leadership that was shown by the apostles? And the great fellowship, see, it, it, it's hard to be a good leader if you don't have willing followers, right? And so that, that's a critical element. And the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So that meant that success happened, right? Success happened. Problem was dealt with, dealt with immediately. These men were chosen that that had these qualifications that were set forth uh, by the uh, by the apostles in that day and time, and and, and prayer was involved. And you know, uh, of course, here it was the apostles. They were basically doing the work there that uh, our elders do, and. Um, that, that's how, I can't remember which president it was. Was it McKinley? It was a member of the church, possibly. Garfield. But who was it? Garfield. Garfield. Sorry, it was Garfield that uh, he made the uh, statement. He was quoted as saying, "You know, he was an elder in the church, and he said, I stepped down from the highest office to become president of the United States.' And that's true. That's true." We need to every day be lifting up our elders in prayer by name. The, the job that they have taken on, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around the gravity of it. Uh, they're, they're entrusted with keeping up, uh, watching after our souls. And that is a huge, huge responsibility. And uh, we're very fortunate here that we've got uh, great elders 
very thankful for them. But we need to be praying for them uh, every day uh, by name. So prayer was obviously important to these folks. So we're introduced to Stephen here in, uh, see, we're first introduced to him uh, here in verse, uh, verse 5. Okay, so here's the, the men are in place, but then more is said about Stephen in these verses than any of the other six. And I think the author here is setting us up to be talking about Stephen a whole lot. Okay, so as we go into verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now, I believe this is the first recorded example, if I'm not mistaken, of a non-apostle who had been granted miraculous gifts. Okay? So, uh, not only was Stephen uh, entrusted with the job that, we're, that we saw here in the first uh, seven verses, but we're also seeing that uh, he was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. So he was given that gift. Then, but there's, he was, you know, I told you the church was growing, not only being added, but multiplying. And that was creating quite a stir. Uh, the locals were really starting to take notice. And there's getting ready to be some uh, things happen as a result of that. You know, th th that's the thing about church growth. When the church is growing and doing great things and people are being saved and people are coming to Christ, who hates that worse than anybody? <laughs> Satan, right? Satan hates that. Well, we're seeing that that's happening here and now we're going to see that uh, Satan is really going to get to work. Look at verse 9. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, uh, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Uh, I think those were uh, maybe Jews that had one time been slaves, but had been freed. And it says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So not only was Stephen... Uh, doing these signs and wonders and miracles, but he was coupling that with uh, speaking the word. Okay? So uh, not only was he spent, and, and that the purpose of the, of the miracles is to confirm what was being said in that day and time. Why did they need it? Because they didn't have this New Testament, right? It was, uh, they were living the New Testament. And so, uh, so they started disputing with Stephen. But it's interesting that it says uh, Stephen must have been a really good orator and really knew his stuff. And he says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Uh, you're, you're going to see some parallels here and some descriptions much like uh, of, of Stephen, much like we saw of Jesus. And you remember uh, uh, they said that Jesus spoke as one uh, having authority. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, it means he, he knew what he was talking about. And it was obvious that he knew what he was talking about uh, on, on the subjects that he talked about. And so, Stephen, uh, this is a very similar description. Uh, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So, now they've got a problem. The church is growing uh, and they're like, okay, this is getting out of hand. It's growing, at their expense. it's growing at their expense. That's exactly right. Uh, and Satan is getting to work here, and he's going to be working through these folks. Uh, and so here's what they do. They secretly, uh, verse 11, induced men to say, now if you induce somebody to do something, uh, that's not on the up and up, right? Okay. Uh, says they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Mm. Against Moses and God. So what you're going to see here 
is if, if you were in a court of law, which he's going to end up in a court of law, it was a joke of a trial, but here's count one of the indictment against him. Blaspheming against who? Moses. Okay, that's count one. Count two of the indictment. Blaspheming against who? God. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Moses may have been more serious. That's exactly right. Verse twelve. And they stirred up the people, the elders, and the scribes. These learned individuals. They stirred them up, and they came upon him, seized him, arrested him. Right. Got his mug shot and brought him to the council. And I'm guessing this is the Sanhedrin council, I guess. And uh, you talk about an intimidating experience. Uh, you're brought in before, and it's not a one judge. You're in front of, what, 70? <laughs> 70 uh, or so. And so he says uh, they also, here's not only what they did, uh, not only did they accuse him of speaking blasphemy against Moses and God, but they also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not seek or does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. What's the holy place? The temple. Okay? This holy place and the law. What law? Law of Moses. Okay. Count three of the indictment, continually blaspheming the temple, okay, their place of worship. Count four of this indictment, continuously blaspheming the law of Moses. And they did it by false witness. Isn't it interesting? I'm pretty sure I remember something about the tablets of stone uh, that having to do with Moses and something about bearing false witness. Wasn't that in there somewhere, I think? Right? Exactly. They, they're doing it to defend what they think or defend. That's exactly right. So we have four count indictment. You're blaspheming Moses. You're blaspheming God. This is the accusation. You're continually blaspheming the temple and you're continually blaspheming the law of Moses. They had to do something about Stephen. They had to stop him because he was, he was doing great works. Right? Now, what's interesting is here, Stephen was given an assignment, right? Uh, in the first few verses of chapter 6, he was given an assignment. Well, how did that go? How did that go? How was that project? Making sure that the Hellenist widows were taken care of. Okay, it was successful. Uh, but then it turns to where Stephen is doing something else, right? He is preaching and he's teaching and he's doing signs and he's doing wonders and he's... He's doing miracles, and so he is carrying out, he had a ministry, right? We all, as members of the Lord's church, should have a ministry. Like, things that we do within the body of Christ to help the body of Christ grow. But we also have a mission, right? What is our mission? Our mission should be the exact same mission as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost. So we need to use our gifts of ministry, whatever those are, in order to accomplish a mission that is consistent with the mission of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, seeking and saving those that are lost. And that's what it's about, right? 
Ultimately, we do what we do or should be doing what we do to what we call expand the borders of the kingdom is to bring people to Christ. It's evangelism, isn't it? Seeking and saving those who are lost. That's the mission of Jesus Christ. And if that's the mission of Jesus Christ, that should be our mission as well, right? So then he says, so that's the four-count indictment. Verse, uh, where did I get to? 14, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Where's this place? The temple, right? He'll destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. Uh, talking about... so. You know, it does not specifically say in these verses what Stephen was teaching or what he was talking to these folks about that got them so riled up. But we're learning kind of what has been talked about here. Uh, you remember when Jesus uh, said something about uh, the temple and, and what was about the temple? Do you think maybe they took something a little out of context here? Okay. When he said he'll destroy it, raise it up after three days, what was he talking about? His body, right? Um, and he says, uh, For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the place and change the customs which Moses uh, delivered to us. I think one of the most, well, I think an interesting, wow, it's 720. All right, yikes. Okay. Uh, one of the most interesting things is uh, when you're talking about the temple, or at least one of my, my favorite accounts, is in Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus absolutely shocks the, uh, the disciples that are with him when he says that there will be one day when you see this temple and all of its majesty and it's all of its grandeur. And there's going to come a day that there'll not be one stone set on. In other words, it's going to be totally destroyed. Absolutely totally destroyed. Uh, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 24 was when Jesus drops this bomb on them. And so the disciples think, well, well, that's going to be when Christ returns because the temple is so important to us that if the temple is destroyed, then everything it must be destroyed. There's not going to be anything. That's the, end of the, that's the end of the world. That's it. That's when Jesus will return. And so they even said, okay, well, what's the sign of your coming? He's like, well, there's not going to be any signs of my coming, but this generation will not pass away until that is fulfilled. And sure enough, about 37 years later, the Roman army just comes through and just demolishes the temple in the city of Jerusalem. And, uh, but then he kind of flips the script about, I think it's around verse 36 or thereabouts, where he says, but of that day, it's a different day, of that day you do not know uh, when the Son of Man will come because there will be no signs. And you have to be ready. And that's a very important, I mean, he really emphasizes that point. And then he follows it up with three parables that illustrate the importance of being ready. Uh, at the end of chapter 24 and then on into chapter 25, the parable of the talents being one of them. Okay? It's talking about the primary, the primary uh, lesson, although you can draw several lessons from the parable of the talents, is uh, you've got to be ready for when the master comes back. Okay. When the master comes back, he better find you doing what he left you to do and being what he left you to be. Okay, So uh, I took a little detour there. Okay. All right. Any comments or questions on chapter 6? So this, this, this gives us the context. Stephen has created a stir. He's now been arrested. He's before the council. Uh, there have been four counts and an indictment against him, blaspheming Moses, blaspheming God, consistently blaspheming the temple, continuously blaspheming the law of Moses. So let's go into chapter 7. 
So the high priest said, are these things so? Are these things so? Chapter 7 is a long chapter, uh, but it's a very interesting chapter. And so Stephen uh, has a very interesting response to this question from the high priest, are these things so? This is his opportunity uh, to defend himself. But what you're going to see, more than Stephen defending himself, he is defending Christianity. And uh, if, if he wanted to calm the people down, if he wanted to be found not guilty, if he wanted to uh, try to convince them that they had taken what he said out of context, this is not the way to do it because he's getting ready to absolutely uh, uh, <laughs> really create a stir among them. So let's look at what happens. And he said, brethren and fathers, so he's, he's respectful in the beginning of his defense. He says, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives. And we, we, we've heard this before, right? And come to the land I will show you when he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, uh, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Who's going to oppress them 400 years? Egyptians, and the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. So we're getting a history lesson. We're getting a history lesson from Stephen about their own heritage. And then he goes into the patriarchs. And the patriarchs, he says, uh, becoming envious, so Joseph into Egypt. We remember that, right? But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. We remember that. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Why is he going into this? I, I'd like your comments. I, had a, I, I kind of had a hard time figuring that out. Why is he going into this history lesson? He's going back, he's talking about Abraham and how God called Abraham to, to leave his home and and he makes this promise to Abraham, well, to and Abraham's descendants, right? Okay, so everything is pointing to Jesus being the fulfillment of the promises made, right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's probably not telling them anything they didn't already know, right? He, he, he's getting them on, and he, he talks about, he doesn't say your ancestors or your fathers. He says what? Our, okay? 
hour. Okay? Any other thoughts on that? I think it's easier to introduce new things once you have a common background. Oh, yeah. That's exactly right. You uh, develop a commonality, uh, then it makes it easier to introduce uh, something. That, yeah, that's good. Okay? Chris, yeah. I think you're going to find that it makes sense why they're going to start with that. Because mm -hmm. what he's doing with the tissue lesson is saying, what you're doing here today is not going to get it. Exactly. Because the highlights he gets in Jewish history are the rebellion, exactly. the revolt, right. the disobedience. And he's saying, just like this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, insulting someone, but not only insulting them, but insulting your, their, their parents and their grandparents and great-grandparents and on and on and on, right? All right, let's keep going. Now he uh, switches gears a little bit in verse 17. He says, but, but still the his, their history, but when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers. He came along at the time that God, uh, it, God was ready to fulfill this promise, right? Making them expose their babies so that they might not live. And at that time, Moses was born. Who else was born at a time when babies were killed? Jesus, right? It's amazing all the parallels. And was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. What do you find interesting about that last sentence? Moses didn't think as much of himself as Stephen did. Exactly. He was mighty in words and deeds. What was one of the excuses that Moses gave? Oh, you don't want me. Why? I'm not eloquent in speech. Well, the, the account says he was mighty in deeds, but also in words. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, we remember what happened there. He defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But did they understand? They did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, now he's getting ready to learn that uh, what he did the prior day is known, right? Uh, men, your brethren, why do you wrong one another? And the, but he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Oops. People know. So what does that mean he's going to have to do? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, so now Moses is how old? 80. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame and fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at sight, drew near to observe. The voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Uh, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning. It's time that he's getting ready to let them go. And I have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush? He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Okay? Uh, Moses had actually been rejected, right? Who else had been rejected? Jesus Christ had been rejected. I think 37 is very, verse 37 is very interesting. This is that Moses 
Here's what Stephen says. This is that Moses. It, he's like, okay, you're accusing me of blaspheming the law of Moses, but you're also accusing me of blaspheming Moses. You want to talk about Moses? This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Who is he talking about? Jesus Christ. Moses pointed here very, very clearly to, in verse 37 to Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ who the very people that are accusing Stephen of blaspheming Moses and God was pointing to said, you need to hear him. Absolute. Stephen is exposing what? Their hypocrisy, right? Their absolute total hypocrisy. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles uh, to give to us whom our fathers, what? Would not obey. Your ancestors... Your ancestors rejected Moses, and you're accusing me of blaspheming Moses? And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. Here's where they go into idolatry. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Remember, this is their ancestors saying this. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol and idols, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And he quotes, I believe it's Amos, Amos chapter, uh, Amos chapter five there. So, whenever they reject, when God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. You know, God's going to let us worship whoever we want to worship, right? It's our choice. Now, if we make the wrong choice, we'll suffer the consequences. But he turned them over and let them do it. So that's Moses. He talks about the rejection of Moses. How even though he was uh, accused of blaspheming Moses, the law of Moses, he points out, what their ancestors did, rejecting Moses. And not only uh, rejecting Moses, but not following uh, the laws that he set down, that he got from God. Now, now we uh, go now into talking about the tabernacle. Verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle witness in the wilderness as he appointed instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with jo Joshua into the land promised by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet said. So obviously in Stephen's teaching that's gotten them all fired up, he's talking about the how it's not going to be necessary to worship in the, the what's the temple, all right? It had historical significance to them. But going forward, it's not about worshiping in the temple. Uh, you remember the conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well? And after Jesus points out about her uh, uh, lifestyle, she quickly changes the subject to ha wanting to have a discussion about where to worship, right? You know, some say we should worship in Jerusalem. What's Jesus' response? The time has come and now is what? What's that? Right. It's not about where, it's about how. It's about your heart, right? Exactly, exactly. 
you cannot limit God to a specific geographic area, right? Right? Okay, where did I get to here? Uh, here he says, uh, in, Isaiah, he quote, in, in verse 49, he quotes Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? So Stephen has probably talked about how, uh, how they are to worship. You know, these uh, people that were judging Stephen... You know, they were probably regular worship goers, right? More than likely. Uh, and we have to be careful that, you know, uh, that we obviously need to come together and worship as God tells us to do, but it, it's more than just what we got to live it the rest of the week, right? Exactly. He was taking on their tradition. Absolutely. So here's his background. He goes back through their history, many, many years of their history. Talks about not only, he talks about their forefathers, their ancestors. And here is where he absolutely, in verse 51, just, he basically seals his fate. You stiff necked. What's that mean? Stubborn, uh, not, res not receptive to teaching, okay? You stiff-necked and, uh-oh, uh uncircumcised. There, there's that word. Did he just compare them to the Gentiles? Okay. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit just as your fathers did, so do you. Right? Not only do you resist teaching, but so did your forefathers. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. Of whom you... Oh, look at this accusation. The just one is who? Jesus Christ. Of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. We heard that just a few chapters ago, didn't we? With, we could hand you crucify the Son of God. But these folks had a little different response, didn't they? who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. They weren't pleased with Stephen. They weren't pleased with Stephen. What's, it? What's that commercial, Captain Obvious? This is also where it goes from legal to illegal. Yeah, a legal proceeding becomes a mob mentality, right? Uh, they're now doing away with all formalities. Well, legally, they can't kill him. Right, right. That's exactly right. They can't kill him. Yes. The same one who was presiding at another trial, right? Verse 54, here's what they did after Stephen drops this bomb on them. He says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now, we heard similar language just a few chapters ago in Peter's sermon. They were cut to the heart, too. But I think this is a little different Greek word <laughs> here. Uh, I think if you've got the English Standard Version, what does it say? Does it say something about like they were enraged? Furious, okay? It's, yeah. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. You really got to be mad at somebody to just chomp down a bite on them, right? Uh, I remember whenever I was a kid, my cousin would do that. He would get mad and, and 
bite. Um, now, I didn't do that back, but he, 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 he was bad about that. Um, he says, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, and this made him even madder, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, when we hear about Jesus at the right hand of God, what position is Jesus usually in? Seated at the right hand of God. Who says he's standing? Kind of makes you think he's really into what's going on with his servant Stephen, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a sign of the pride that he has of Stephen. And said, look, see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, this made them even madder. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes. And we're getting ready to be introduced to somebody else at the feet of a young man named Saul. They got rid of their outer garments. Why? Give them more room to throw, right? Young man named Saul. You, you got to wonder what Saul, uh, you know, what kind, of he, what kind of regret he had, even after he became a Christian. Do you think that that still weighed on him? Sure. The fact that he was part of this? Absolutely. He, he remembered that, you know, he was part of this. He was forgiven. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, look at the parallels here. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Did you hear? Where have you heard something very similar to that? At the cross, right? At the cross. Am I out of time? I'm out of time. Okay. Uh, they knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Have we heard that before? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The parallels here. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Um, Luke 23, verse 46 is where you hear Jesus saying uh, that. Uh, it says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Because we know when we, when we die, our body decays, but our spirit, just like Stephen's, goes to be with Christ until the time that Christ returns and brings us back with him. All right. I guess that's it. Thank you all for your good attention.